Good morning. Please stand by for my 0930 readout. All right, long walks on the beach. Uh, chocolate movies. No, 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 no. Uh, chocolate, comma, movies. Uh, pizza. And Wonder Woman. Okay. All right, Ira. Patch into the CompuCupid computer and find me a date. Who is addressing the Iraq computer? It's Paul, Ira. It's Paul. You know me. The CompuCupid computer is programmed for two basic functions. Has a database for dissemination. I know what it does, Ira. That's why I'm having you do this. My social life needs a little pick-me-up, but I haven't had any luck finding a date on my own. I don't know why. I am more than prepared to tell you why. No, what I need you to do, Ira, is patch into the CompuCupid and find me a date. That is a complex time-consuming function with no certain outcome. What are you talking about? You're the most powerful computer in the whole Linda Carter Wonder Woman universe. I'm sure you can find someone that would love to meet me. Do you know what Fat Chance means? Wow. Fat Chance? Really? Are you saying there's no one out there for me? No comment. Why, of all the stinking, uh, no good, uh, don't laugh at me. Uh, don't make me delete your program. Uh, uh, what? Oh, we're recording. Oh, oh. <clears throat> uh, hi, and welcome to Satin Tights, a Wonder Woman podcast. I'm your host, Paul K. Bisson. Uh, my co-host, Ray Caspio, is not here with me right now, but don't worry. You'll be hearing from him in just a moment. Now, this isn't our regular podcast review show. This is something a little different, something we like to call from the files of the Iraq computer. Naturally. Shh. Now, this is where we deviate from our normal reviews of the Wonder Woman TV series to bring you something a little different. And for our first edition of From the Files of the Iraq Computer, we're going to bring you the long-awaited part two of the special Wonder Woman podcast crossover discussion of the Gal Gadot Wonder Woman movie that was released this year. Now, it was organized and produced and edited by Angela over at the Wonder Woman Warrior for Peace podcast. So she invited the hosts of other Wonder Woman podcasts to come together and discuss the movie. Her guests include Matt from the Radio Free Themyscira podcast. You can find him at Blueberry.com slash Radio Free Themyscira. Uh, Blueberry is spelled B-L-U-B-R-R-Y. Also on the panel is Diabolu Frank from the Diana Prince Wonder Woman podcast. You can find him at new-wonder-woman.blogspot.com. And our very own Ray Caspio from Satin Tights is also uh, on the panel discussion. I, unfortunately, was not present. Uh, I would have loved to have shared my thoughts about the movie, but I was on a plane 35,000 feet in the air at the time. Now, this is a three-part crossover discussion, and you can listen to part one on episode 16 of Angela's Wonder Woman Warrior for Peace podcast. Part two, you're about to hear right now. So if you haven't heard part one yet, go over to Angela's site and listen to that one first because part two picks up right in midstream. All right, so that's it. I'm out of here. That's done. Uh, without any further ado, Ira, we ready? Affirmative. Here is part two of the Wonder Woman podcast crossover discussion on Wonder Woman starring Gal Gadot. Okay, uh, looking at my notes here. Oh, some of the more references that, uh, again, the, the fangirl fanboy problems. Um, I wish that Steve had called her Angel just like once, Ooh. just so we could have that. And There's a we meta kept reference seeing... there. Hmm? There's a meta reference to that. Uh, go ahead Was continue there? and then I'll say it. In the movie? Uh, kind of. It's um, the scene where uh, he she saves her in the water, saves him in the water. There's that shot where she's standing there uh, on the wreckage of the wing, and you see the sun behind her, like, glowing mm -hmm. around her. Mm -hmm. The track for yeah. that scene is called Angel on the Wing. Oh, okay. So it's like, I didn't I'm make that connection. I'm excited, but at the same time, I'm like, yeah, but she had to <laughs> in the film <laughs> verbatim. Yeah. And then uh, we kept seeing different animals on Themyscira. Could we just have gotten a kangaroo? Just one little, like, like maybe a baby? Like we one got of the an armadillo. One of the... <laughs> There was an armadillo, and there was like, like a one of those big horned uh, cow bull things that you get in in Greece. I don't I don't know the name, um, but like like even it doesn't have to be a giant kanga, but but maybe just like have an Amazon like holding a little baby kangaroo in her arms would mm -hmm. would have been would have been amazing. 
Yeah. Oh, God. That, Chris Pine said he'll come back and play Jumpa in the next film. <laughs> That's the weirdest reincarnation for Steam Trevor's theory I've heard yet, and I love it. <laughs> How did I... Uh, yeah, that would be that would be a thing. Uh, see, that's one of the that's one of the weird sci-fi fantasy things that they had to drop. Yeah, to more I get accessible. it. Uh, yeah, and I did but, realize I, I don't remember if this was on on your uh, review show, Frank, or one of the like dozen <laughs> dozen others that I've listened to the past week. But somebody at some point mentioned that you know they did the same thing with Thor. They really simplified his his origin. They got rid of the whole Donald Blake thing. And mm-hmm. when I heard that, I was like. Yeah, okay, that that makes sense. You know, big mythological hero, and, and them cutting t- cutting the origin down to to make it more palatable for for the mainstream. Okay, and, I yeah, can live with and that. both of those characters in the comics, they've done that too a couple of times too, back and forth. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, they, I like how they reference both. Uh, both in Thor, they have a little reference to Donald Blake, and then in Wonder Woman, they do have that Diana uh, Prince. Yeah, yeah, that, that was too. good. And the glasses. The glasses. the glasses. Did anybody the else cry the first time they saw Diana Prince? Uh, in the film? I don't normally cry at movies, so no, but it was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, I, I started I started tearing up, especially when he named her. I always cry on my second viewings of these films. Uh, I'm too intense the first ones, but then the second ones, I'm always a bawling mess. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't actually cry, but I did get choked up, actually, during the battle on the beach, uh, which was a, a, too long of a story, oh. but... Uh, that's that's the thing that got to me is got seeing all those actresses getting to take part in that kind of adventure, which doesn't happen nearly enough. So, but yeah, I, I did love seeing her in the trailer though. When when they showed her with the glass in the trailer, that's one of the first things that made me think, okay, but this might be all right. This might be the movie I've been waiting for. So it was it was still a great moment. It's just I I got it more in the trailer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, costume wise, did anybody else notice the one Amazon? Um, during one of the the fight training sequences, her bodice half of it was like a flesh tone and half of it was dark brown. Did anybody else see that? Mm-mm. No. Okay. I, I I'm the only one. I guess that that uh, I liked that as kind of a reference to the the original origin uh, of the Amazons with the whole mastectomy thing. Uh, you oh. know, so that mm. they could do archery better. It, it visually it looked like that that was the case, even though obviously it wasn't actually. Well, uh, um, Gal made a joke about that on some talk shows, so people on set were true. aware of that, so maybe so, yeah. Yeah. It was Antiope uh, that had the eagle cut out, right? Yes, uh, or yeah, it was, was Hippolyta. Cool. That was neat. Yeah. Yeah. She had the, the, the rub of her, yeah, on her chest. That, that was cool. Yeah. Looked mm-hmm. comfortable, too. <laughs> and then later she had the uh, gold eagle. As Diana was leaving the island, she was in a costume that had the full gold eagle on it. And as as the only woman here, can I just have a, a very girly moment and say, oh my goodness, I yeah. want the Amazon hair braiding powers. That was amazing. <laughs> they had fishtails and micro braids and everyone's hair looked so incredible. I was just like, oh, let me go to Paradise Island and learn your ways. <laughs> well, I enjoyed that too. I wish I had, I wish I still had long hair. I'd be Amazon braiding my hair myself. <laughs> Oh, that was so awesome. Uh, I do want to say, too, I loved that the Amazons weren't all decked out in warrior garb. I loved that you could see that there was a variety of, of society there. It wasn't just about yes. the, the action. Yes. So True. I do kind of miss yeah. the little, the, uh, the, the 90s they all wore on the, uh, the Linda Carter show. Those, were always, those always looked fun. Uh, <laughs> like that was on the beach, you know? <laughs> yeah. But it's not it's not the bustiers from the original Marson run, of course. But <laughs> we only saw the nineteen teens fashions. We still have the forties, the sixties, the eighties. We've got plenty of time for that. Mm. <laughs> oh, we, yeah, we are getting to see the white suit in the future, maybe like maybe in a flashback to what she's been doing in Man's World. Wasn't That'd wasn't cool. she in a wasn't she in a white costume in the the um, the Justice League trailer? I think she's in a white pantsuit uh, at one point. Yeah, so. and I remember she wore the white suit in Batman versus Superman. Okay. It, it does seem to be a theme, There's and I approve. Yeah. A white suit, especially because they didn't. That was not a TV thing, right? That was that was exclusive to the comics, wasn't it? Yes, well, correct. the white suit. That was the that was the mod era, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Yep. Yeah. So I, I I like that that's getting some some usage, and again, it's it's done in a nice subtle way. Something you'll miss if it doesn't matter to you, and for somebody like me, I can geek out over that. So yeah, very cool. Mm-hmm. Oh, so we mentioned the beach scene a moment ago. Who else wishes that the Amazons could take a, a bullet better? I was hoping to see like one of them like take a bullet, look down, surprised at what the hell was that, and then just rush at the the German. Uh, that could have been fun. I I don't know that. Uh... I mean, they're, they're not particularly superhuman in this version. It's more just that they're mm. highly trained warriors, right? Even yeah, a highly right. trained warrior, yeah. a bullet is going to take you down. They're, they're above average. <laughs> True. I suppose you're right, yeah. Fam, fanboy thing, again. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of which, we needed more Etta Candy. There was not enough Etta Candy in that movie. She was great, but we needed more. Seriously... I, I thought, um, was it Lucy Davis did a yes. did a really great job. I, that I loved that she was comic relief mm. as well as a fully capable, a fully capable of you know yes heading their mission. Yeah, yeah. That that part where you uh, know, they let her. The, they're uh, they're running down, uh, one of the uh, the guys who are attacking them try to run down the alleyway and she's standing there with a the god killer like uh uh-uh. uh. Like, <laughs> that was so good. She can she she's not useless in a combat situation. <laughs> She might not have training, nope. but she's she can hold her own in those situations. Which yeah, cool. we we need a. I mean, the the, the sequel is probably going to be set in the modern day, but maybe just some flashbacks to to Etta and Diana's adventures in the in the twenties, maybe roaring twenties. They go to New York and they they uh, hit the town. That would be amazing. I, I want to see that movie. Yeah, the thing uh, that got me about the Eddie Candy from the movie is it, to, to my mind, most recalled Perez's version. Uh, there, there are elements of the classic version, but it's really more Perez's version. And, uh, you know, Ed is really not a common name anymore. Uh, what I want to see in the next movies is an Etta Candy type in her Golden Age mold. And maybe she's just not named Etta Candy, but I, I want to see that woo-woo, you know, that, that, that spirit uh, uh, in the Wonder Woman movie. Because uh, I'm trying to think as far as supporting casts, what you would need, what she would play off well uh, for, for future movies. And I really do think you could use that type of character. I think that'd be very valuable for the f- sequels. Mm-hmm. My ideal just- like, sequel-like fan thing would be that um, in modern day, uh, like, Bruce Wayne has St- uh, Etta Candy's, like, granddaughter working for him and this Etta Candy Jr. who is like in the comic she's a full figured black woman uh, goes to the uh, the men that worked with Wonder Woman in World War One, and they tell their stories about working with Wonder Woman outside of the, the eye of society throughout the the decades since World War II World War One. that would be my, my family I don't know that they would still be it, alive but... would they? because I mean that was not I mean, now but yeah they'd be about 130 yeah they, uh, 130 <laughs> What, what did you guys think about those? Um, pretty impressive. I keep wanting to call them the Howling Commandos, even though technically they weren't the Howling Commandos. But what what y'all think about that? They were. T- I the loved them. <laughs> I I really loved the flavor that they brought to the movie, and uh, how Diana had a unique relationship with each of them. I think one of my favorite moments in the film, uh, if not my favorite moment. Um, no, it wasn't my favorite moment. I'll say it's one of my favorite moments. Was when uh, Charlie, it's the night after he sings and uh, he's wor- he doesn't want to continue with them. And she said, but Charlie, who would sing for us? Oh, that was so good. And for me, and then she just lights up with that smile. And for me, that was quintessential Wonder Woman right there. She's always looking for the best uh, in everyone, in every situation. And she's inspiring people by just little little positive things like that. It's like she's changing she's hearts giving... and changing the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you go, man. <laughs> yeah, I, I I really liked uh, what they did with them, even though it was very much a, a Howling Commandos type thing. Um, one of them is one of the Blackhawks, right? Do, do I understand that correctly? Does anybody I know? Did... I heard that... Um, that was a was thing Samir? that that actor put out on Instagram or Twitter or something. Uh, but uh, I've listened to other podcasts, and it, 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 nobody knows really where he got that from. But it, mm. no relation to the Blackhawks character. No relation. Uh, no. Oh, okay. No. Uh, I, 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 that's what I heard that too. But I I, 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 I googled around this morning trying to find out because uh, I heard that he was a, a, a Blackhawk, and the Native American man had his like his own 
1940s comic called Chief, but I looked around from this morning, I couldn't find reference to either, so... Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and he's definitely somebody... not Apache Chief, so people he's stop not... sharing that. Yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> oh my god. People are saying he's Apache Chief? It's, especially whenever, like, the first uh, pictures came out of it, but, like, no. Oh, really? No. <laughs> Guys, stop. And my theory <laughs> was... I wonder... A... Sorry. What movie people are watching? Well, m- m- most of it came when the uh, the first time we see that photo, and people were also thinking uh-huh. that the man with the mustache was Zatara, which I wish he had been, but whatever. That would have been um, cool. Oh, yeah. I kept trying to do Easy Company. The Easy Company had a Native American member as well, but it it just didn't play out that way. Uh, I I think that we all want to create Easter eggs where there aren't any with that group of people. Uh, I I didn't really care a lot about them as characters, but I cared very much about what they brought out of Wonder Woman, as you said. Mm -hmm. How she reacted to them and and what she did for them uh, showed what an incredible character she is. And she's the one that's important Mm -hmm. to me, especially in this situation where she's the only one who's going to get to go forward from this movie. So I, I value them for what they brought for her. Yeah, they introduced they racism. Were ser- yeah, for they her. were serving her story absolutely, rather than she was serving their story, which I think is quite revolutionary. Because every time supporting characters like that are introduced in the comics, the issue ends up becoming all about them, uh, and Diana gets pushed into the background. And this time, th- you, yeah, th- you, like you said, they really got to bring out the best in her. Oh, and snaps for uh, them for casting an actual Native American as a Native American a character. That shouldn't be a hard thing, but it doesn't seem to happen a lot of times. <laughs> well, I'm hoping they're learning their lesson because a lot of movies seem to have gotten taken down by that uh, a wannabe colored blindedness. And, you know, it's just there's there's no sense in that. It, it You're just asking for trouble when you do that. And give people roles that actually are of the of the race and nationality or what have you mm-hmm. that you're trying to cast for god's sake i mean nobody wants another ghost in the shell nobody wants another gods of egypt it's like it's just the smart oh. thing to do <laughs> plus i mean there's just something to that too the, the his voice and the way he carried himself you could tell that he was a, a real indigenous person so he, there's a verisimilitude that you get from hiring the correct person to play these parts yeah, and he introduces himself in his native language to her um, the first time we see him. And him. she knows his language. Yeah, that's why I was, that was, I was really uh, curious to see if, she, does she know new world languages? <laughs> does she, I'm sorry? I, that was, I was curious to see whenever he did that, I was like, oh, does she does she speak new world languages? Or, oh, nah, she did. <laughs> I, I, she said in the movie, I think that uh, the Amazons speak 200, over 200 languages. <laughs> How? So I think it's fascinating they, that they, they never keep gave in any touch explanation that. for that. Was 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 my shtick? They they don't even have a, a magic sphere. How on earth are they speaking these modern languages that are, you know, were, were dreamt up three thousand years after they left? Well, we don't know that they don't have the magic sphere. Uh-uh. They've never said that's that. true. We didn't we didn't see it, but those those mean it wasn't there. Right. Maybe maybe that was in the maybe that was in the hall of or the the tower with the artifacts. They need to Imagine access the uh, contemporary equivalent of Guns and Ammo magazine, though. That would be very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm a big fan of the Magic Sphere, so I would definitely be. A sp- I don't. I don't see it coming into the cinematic universe, but I'm a big fan of it, and I, I'd love to see some variation on that. Maybe they have a, a an oracle or something that's able to give them information like that. That would be cool. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, like uh, speaking of like the oracle, there's a real lack of religion on the island. Well, like, I mean, the bang. gods are all dead. So. Oh right, we already talked about. I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. No, no, no worries. Yeah. Hippolyta did say at one point, you know, we thank the gods for their gift, and I'm like, uh, th- th- they're not around to to hear the thank you. <laughs> Well, they, I, I think they just have a much different perspective on that than the rest of us do. For them, it might be like Thanksgiving, mm-hmm. thanking their forebears for giving them these gifts. No, now that's they're gone. True. Uh, that's Diana's what's so cool day. about the huh? Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, that's what's so cool about the. That. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's what's so cool about the fairy tale is we interpret it as a fairy tale being told from a mother to a daughter, but those gods existed. So where's the line for, for them? They, they're they're going to have a completely different perspective than we do, which is awesome. Mm-hmm. That, and only the Greeks are dead, supposedly. You know, I mean, that doesn't that doesn't preclude 
artifacts that have the spirits of the gods Ooh. still in them that doesn't preclude other pantheons. You, there's oh. there, Nothing's taken away. It's still there. Oh, you just have to figure out how to work it in. But we know at least two more gods existed in the world because of Suicide Squad. Ha! Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, sure. I forgot about that. <laughs> Maybe maybe they'll just bring in the, the, the Roman pantheon and say, Ooh. oh, hey, look, it's basically the same thing. Or they've been hiding out as the Romans for all this time. Oh, there you go. Yeah. They, they each went to their respective planets. Zeus went to Jupiter. Uh, well, no, Ares didn't go to Mars. Um, Poseidon went to Neptune. Yeah, that that uh, absolutely. And and then the Green Lanterns come and they, they bring them all back. Yeah, that, that's how... That's how Justice League 2 has to go. Absolutely. And if nothing else, there's always had canon. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> that was that was one thing I thought was hilarious in my, my most recent issue of the uh, the 40s comics where Mars is literally on the planet Mars and, and yeah. directing his his uh, his influence on World War II from there. I'm just like, okay, I'm just going to go with it because comics – the beauty of weird sci-fi fantasy. Ah. Yep. And now we yep. know how Dr. Manhattan comes in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <Yeah. goodness. sighs> Dr. Manhattan is Mars. No, wait, that's that's just mixing up way too much. <laughs> Manhattan is Mars? <laughs> well, he, he was on Mars, wasn't he? Right. No, uh, no, yeah, was yeah. he on the moon? <laughs> Mars, Mars, yeah. He was on, okay. Mm-hmm. I never finished Watchmen. I got like halfway through and was like, I don't like this. Might, might try the book. Instead. No, that, that's oh, what I'm saying. The book. The book. Right, I got halfway enough. through the book and was just like, I don't care for this. There's a podcast in that. There's a lot. There's a great podcast in that. <laughs> I, I, I want you to be the person who goes out there and says, "I'm the one who doesn't like Watchmen." I will join you. I'll walk with you. But <laughs> but we're going to be burned and tarred and feathered. It's going to be bad. But it's going to be fun too. Oh no! I think I, got... have, I think we'll have an I am Spartacus moment with that. I think most people. <laughs> it, it, it was just so depressing and grim and i was just like i don't need to be reading this i i read comics for escapism not to be depressed like that's the point of the book and it's like okay fine i get it that's what because at the time comics needed that that kick in the butt to get back on track and like fair enough but reading it now yeah i don't read it for that i read it i read these books for escapism (laughs) well and it's the ultimate cosplay of osman deus though i love that costume (laughs) <laughs> it's the ultimate extension of realism in comics and shows why that's a kind of a dead end. Uh, and unfortunately, people decide there's a launching point instead. Yeah, that's uh, it's unfortunate. Um, checking my notes here. Oh, we have to talk about the No Man's Land scene. Oh. Easily, oh, easily the best beautiful. scene in this movie. One of the best scenes in superhero cinema. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I I can agree with that. I put it right up there with that. That's uh, another one. Continuous shot they did in Avengers. I put it right oh, there with that. Oh, that was so great. It's yeah. Yeah, that scene was another one where I was just sitting there crying, and I loved the nod to the spin mm. that kicked it off when she kind of did the spin preparation move and instead uh, bent down and took out her ponytail and whipped her head around. Um, <sighs> I thought that was a really nice nod to the spin without actually doing it. And then just the way she carried herself walking up that ladder and uh, saying that I'm going to do this no matter what. It's, it's no. And you're not going to stop no me. No man's land. I, yeah. I, I, I no know man. it's. It was. Yeah, exactly. It was. It's It's the whole Eowyn thing. It, it was probably too obvious. And that's why they didn't go for it. Mm-hmm. But, but I mean, part yeah. of me went when he said, Diana, that's no man's land. Part of me really wanted her to say, "I am no man," and then, yeah, but but no, too too obvious, too Tolkien for I, for this. And movie. Uh, unlike the other DCU movies, this movie understands subtlety. Yes. Yes, <laughs> and and you actually have to do a little thinking and put things together rather than being beaten over the head with <laughs> loudness yeah. and. I, I didn't cry in this uh, movie. Masculinity. But on the No Man's Land part, I was holding my boyfriend's hand at the time, and I think I might have just located his thumb because I was squeezing so hard in excitement. <laughs> I almost stood up. I had yeah. I had the biggest yeah. grin on my face. I was just like, finally, Wonder Woman. And the, part, the way they, they slipped the uh, the uh, She With You song, the, her, her, her new theme, the way they slipped that into there, and it kind of built up, and then when she starts running, it starts, and... Ugh! <laughs> 
and how about the fact that movie executives wanted um, the build up to No Man's Land mm-hmm. cut where she's walking through and deflecting the bullets. They said get right to the fight. No, no. Yeah. And Patty Jenkins had to fight for that. And yeah, I'm so glad she well, it's did like in, uh, and bracelets because is it's it's uh, yes, it's her signature. And move. that's how it. Nobody else. Does it needs that. to kick off that way. Right, right. It, it's like a, it's like right. a, uh, somewhere over the rainbow and um, my, uh, part of your world. Those two shots they were almost cut from their respective movies, and the, and they made the film. They like this is the same situation here. Yeah. Yeah, trust trust the director, not the people mm-hmm. in the suits mm-hmm. who are sitting behind a desk. Which are also the only people who called out her as a woman and can't do stuff for the men in the suits in the movie. The soldiers in that scene were just surprised about it. They weren't like a woman in the suit in the in the in the trenches. Bah. Yeah, it was it was mm-hmm. interesting that they didn't really focus on the man versus woman thing, but I, I kind of liked it that they didn't make mm-hmm. the movie all about that. They they just showed you know she's she's there and she's helping out and people are willing to accept it because they are so desperate they need any help they can get well she's there she's capable yeah. she's she's making the decision and following it through yeah. mm-hmm. and uh, and you don't need to with no apology she has no concept of sexism uh, does she i guess no yeah. well no. she's she's never known any other sex but yeah paradise privilege <laughs> nice privilege uh, yeah uh. Um, and then in the scene afterwards, now I, I haven't, I've only seen the movie twice and I, I heard this rumor after, also I don't speak French, but apparently they do call her Wonder Woman in French in that scene in the town after, uh, after she saves it and they're having their, their dance party thing. Perfect. I, 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 that's a rumor that I heard. I don't know that that's, uh, that that's confirmed or not, but, but supposedly, cause like when, when the credits were rolling, and, and they go through the cast list. I looked and I was like, oh, they just list her as Diana. Oh my goodness, we just had a Wonder Woman movie where they never said Wonder Woman. Yeah, which, I thought, which I thought, yeah, was, was a bit... Well, I, I mean, well, we had an Avengers movie where they never said Avengers Assemble, but that just that just really struck me as odd. But if, if they did have her... But you also didn't notice it until the end this of the, is until true. the credits. Yep. That is mm-hmm. that is absolutely true. So what? How important mm-hmm. really was it? Well, know? I was wondering yeah. about it. So I thought what we we're going to get were like um, that scene where Etta Candy is calling them. They're on the phone with her. I thought like she was going to turn over a newspaper and it'd say, uh, "Who is the Wonder Woman?" And she'd be like, "Wonder Woman? Huh, that doesn't really roll off the tongue. I don't like that." Something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's like like in Suicide Squad for some kind of Suicide Squad. <laughs> Maybe maybe that's why they avoided it. It's kind of cliche at this point. I mean, all the way back to to the first Christopher Reeve Superman. Oh, he's a Superman. We're going to put it in the newspaper. Some kind of Wonder Woman. Well, also if she was oh, some kind, also if she was in the paper as Wonder Woman, there would be a record of her mm, existence. That's true. And the only record is people's memories and the photograph. So she's the only one who holds the uh, um, the key to her existence. So okay. so has she been just in hiding all these decades or did she did she participate in World War II and and all the other atrocities and just like keep a really really low profile? Oh my god. They kind of left that up in the air. What if in the next one we see Batman going through stuff and like she's in all these photos from throughout the history but oh, like she's dude. just like in the background like Bigfoot? <laughs> like like the first episode of of the new Doctor Who where they oh, yeah. you've got a conspiracy theory guy and he's going through all these photos from the Titanic and JFK and and the doctors in the background. Oh, that would be amazing. Oh, that would be cool. Oh yeah, she's like she's like uh she's like in the background of Civil War shots and she's like oh not Civil War but uh, That's not like, Civil War. Yeah, right. And she's like at the at the assassination of K, and she's like, uh, she's holding down Marilyn Monroe's skirt when it's being blown up under the. <laughs> like, stop that! Don't do that for a man. Do it for yourself. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> I'd have had a much easier time putting this movie over with my friends if I could have pointed out that she was Connor McCloud, the Clyde McCloud, the Highlander <laughs> throughout the cinematic universe. So, <laughs> I, I wish I thought about that <laughs> when we were seeing the movie. She's on the moon in that moon landing shot, and <laughs> at a I mean, she's concert. in every god. She could probably survive that. Mm-hmm. And actually, that—that's what I uh, after after thinking about the movie for a while. You know, Steve's like, I have to be the one to to go on this plane, 
she she's a demigod. She probably actually would have survived. He didn't need to do the the whole Captain America self sacrifice on a plane shtick. I wondered about that. But of course, that, they didn't yeah. know that at the time. That speeds on a plane shot. That was that was. I mean, it was sad, but but I was also like, really, you, we've gone to all the trouble to try to avoid this being too much like Captain America by setting it. Oh yeah, what, Steve's thirty and years earlier. Do not do well in superhero movies. Yeah, Steve, Steve not I'm snakes on a plane. Steve's, Steve's on, on a plane. <laughs> Yeah. I loved their relationship in the movie. That was really great. I I think between Rucka and this film, they finally found the key to Steve Trevor mm -hmm. and uh, making him really, really important to her mythos as somebody who r really inspired her in a different way. Um, and, and, and their love for each other was evident. Mm -hmm throughout and it wasn't a sorted it wasn't or not even sorted it just wasn't he wasn't just there to be there right like he often is they actually made a character created a bond so for me when they blew up the plane you know i can understand her rage which uh, amazon berserker rage oh, right there so cool. uh, um w being and she had to learn how aries influenced her that she needed, that her um, mission was corrupted at that point by her anger. And she had to put her anger uh, at bay and get back to her mission at hand, which was defeating Ares. She learned that she is just as corruptible as uh, the common person, which she thought she was above. So that was part of the lesson for her. And so I, I, they really allowed his death to have a real impact on her story. Again, serving her story, not Diana serving Steve's story. Mm -hmm. And it was hilarious. They, they had a hilarious relationship. Yep. Loving, flirty, uh, playful. It, it was a joy. It was a joy to experience. Folks, I actually have to go because I have to go to a meeting. Oh, okay. Oh, you're fine, you're fine. So I have to cut out. No worries. 15, so you're good. You, you, you put in an hour, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a last-minute meeting scheduled today. But I appreciate you all, including me and Satin Tights, uh, a Wonder Woman podcast in here. And I hope everybody listens to Satin Tights, where we talk about the Wonder Woman, every episode of the Wonder Woman TV show, one episode at a time. Me and Paul K. Bisson. Definitely looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for including us. And it was lovely to meet all of you. Same. Same. too. Great to all meet right, cool. you. Have... Uh, I think you brought a lot to the podcast. And I'm looking forward to listening to your show now. Thanks. Likewise. Likewise. Have a great uh, rest of the chat. Yep. See ya. See you, man. Bye. And there you have it, part two of the Wonder Woman podcast crossover. Thanks to Angela, Matt, Diabolu, Frank, and of course, Ray Caspio. You can hear the third and final part of the conversation on Matt's podcast, Radio Free Themyscira. And you can listen to more Satin Tights podcasts on iTunes, Google Play Music, and always at satintights.com. Like us on Facebook at Satin Tights, and follow us on Twitter at Satin Tights Pod. For Ray Caspio, I'm Paul K. Bisson. Till next time. Okay, Ira, what have you got for me? Circuits D5 through D7 are overheating. Aw, oh, come on. We haven't been at it that long. We have been at it for two hours. I need a loop job.